because we are children of God, we get to cry out, Abba, Father. And yeah, that is such a weird and a strange term. It's uh, not one that I hear frequently used um, just within normal conversations. Uh, sometimes you sing about it. Sometimes uh, it might come up in a lesson uh, in passing uh, when you read like a text like Galatians, Romans, um, or what we're going to read here in Matthew. But um, the idea uh, is really pertinent to uh, helping us understand what it means to become a child of God. So with those things in mind, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask God to be with us in a word of prayer. I'll ask you to join me in bowing your head, and then we'll start studying the text. Let's pray. Our holy God, we are so grateful that uh, though you are sovereign, that though you are all-knowing, though you are all-powerful, though right now you have angels uh, proclaiming your holiness and, and shouting, how holy you are, though you have the kings that are casting down their, their diadems before you, though you have myriads of angels that are uh, praising you and worshiping you and rejoicing uh, with things that happen here on this earth, you have still made it known to us that you desire to be in a relationship with us. You have uh, put your word in, in a place that is accessible. You have given us so many different translations and so many different languages. You have uh, inspired men and women to uh, talk about these things in ways that we can understand and we can relate to. And I'm grateful, Father, for uh, the weekend that this congregation has put together to uh, train up the next generation to, me to understand what it means to be created, to be formed, to be known, uh, and to be loved by you. I thank you for Terry and for his talents. I thank you for his preparation and for his desire to continue to teach uh, your word and to handle it in an accurate way. I thank you for Courtney and for uh, the grace that you have shared with her, that she can in turn take that grace and share it with uh, the young ladies and uh, create an environment that is safe and create an environment in which they can have good discussion where they desire uh, more discussion. I thank you for uh, Hunter and for his willingness to, to have come down with us this weekend as well and to uh, utilize his desire to teach and to share the gospel uh, on these young men. And I pray that you continue to be with these individuals and with this congregation. Allow them to not grow cold. Allow them to not uh, lose heart in trying to do good. And we ask that you guide us this morning as we study your word and as we study what it means to be in relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer, not forgetting the fellowship that we have with the Holy Spirit. Amen. The idea of Abba Father brings to mind the idea of becoming a father. So these are pictures of my kids right after they were born. And you can kind of see some of the grumpy faces that they make because I've come to believe that cotton is not as comfortable or as comforting as uterus. Um, and that's why they make these, these kind of grumpy faces. Uh, now think about coming into the world. And for some of you that are our parents, you can think about what it's like to come into the world. Uh, I know we have some really new parents here, and so you understand this very well. When a child comes into the world, it is amazing. It is a great thing. You get to see all the prayers that you've been praying answered. You get to see the hope revealed. But what also comes is a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion for the child. They have no idea what's happening. They have no idea what's going on. They, they come into the world maybe in a fearful state and in an anxious state. And for many of us, those moments just kind of continue on in our lives. Uh, maybe you are confused because you don't know what's expected of you. Uh, it's never a fun place to be. Maybe you're fearful because you've had people tell you this is what's going to happen in your life. This is what you need to be doing. This is the direction that you need to be going. And you don't know if you can live up to those expectations. Uh, maybe you're anxious. And so you feel like I don't have a grasp on anything. And even the things that I thought I knew in my spiritual life, I've, I've lost a hold of. And I don't know what to do with this confusion and this fear and this anxiety. And so then... Every Sunday or every Wednesday that your parents bring you to services, this guy stands up here and he's like, hey, I have good news for you. And then they try to tell you some good news. That's really hard to believe that there is good news in the world when you go 
back to school on Monday, when you go back to your quote unquote normal life and you continue to experience confusion, fear, and anxiety. What is the idea of uh, Abba Father? What is the idea of being a child of God? And for those of you that are parents, for those of you that are grandparents, for those of you that have dealt with kids, uh, even in your singleness or uh, have been teachers and have tried to guide anybody to understanding what the good news is, uh, I hope this lesson will not only be beneficial to those minds that, that you're helping shape uh, to love the Lord, but also be helpful to us as, uh, today as well. I want to start with this passage in Matthew 3, because becoming a father made me uh, appreciate more what is happening here. And it kind of put a new perspective on all the events that are circle, uh, circling uh, this account. So Matthew is one of the uh, gentlemen who is writing about the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And this is uh, his account on a great event where Jesus is coming at 30 years old to get baptized by this guy named John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. So the text reads, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan. So it's a, a, a river in the Middle East. It's a, it's a large body of water. Coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? So... Jesus comes to John the Baptist, the guy who's been baptizing people, the guy who's had people come out from Judea and, and ask, like, let me be baptized. Jesus comes to him and he's like, hey, I need you to baptize me. And how would you feel if Jesus was like, hey, I need you to baptize me? Honey? Huh? Yeah. Would you be like, all right, let's do this, man. Like, how would you feel? But like, what, what does that mean? So shocked that like you can't move? Like, Yeah. And, and it's interesting because then we see that. He's like, why are you here? Like, why do you want me to baptize you? And notice what Jesus says. But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. All right, don't answer, but think about it. So righteousness or righteous is one of those words we only use when we're at the church building, right? Uh, what uh, you might be from like Southern California, so maybe you're like righteous, bro. Um, so that's kind of like another context in which you could use that. Uh, but this word is not one that we we think a lot about. And for me, I often thought righteous was synonymous with like holiness. Uh, they're basically interchangeable. Um, because I don't understand really what righteousness means, well, it kind of means the same thing as just being good, being moral, being holy. Uh, in my mind, it kind of meant the same thing of just doing things that are um, equivalent to God's will. And so as long as I do the right things at the right time, then I am considered righteous, holy, and good. Uh, as long as I'm spiritually disciplined and I practice uh, these certain works, then I am righteous before God. But the idea of righteousness is really one of relationship. It, it's a word that is not used to describe just actions, but actions that are appropriate to the relationship. So I've told you guys I'm a father. Um, I'm also a husband. Uh, as a husband, I buy my wife flowers. Uh, as a husband, like I, I'm very affectionate towards my wife. Uh, as a husband... I'm faithful and committed to her. Uh, as a father, I read to my children. As a father, uh, I've, uh, you know, rocked them to bed. As a father, I brush their teeth. Now imagine that you asked me to come and preach here. And you're like, hey, I want you guys to, uh, or sorry, I want you to come and, and work with this congregation here. And imagine that as your preacher, I started buying you flowers. And I started being affectionate towards you. Uh, imagine as your preacher, I was like, hey, I'm going to brush your teeth real quick. Like, you'd be like, that's not appropriate behavior. Like, why? That's not righteous behavior. Why? Because while we are in a relationship as a uh, preacher and congregation, the ideas of what you're doing in your other relationships are not right in this setting or this scenario. Uh, so think about righteousness in terms of relationship. 
Another way to think about this is I can be a good and moral person by myself. I can do everything good and moral by myself. I can't be righteous alone because righteousness involves relationship. Righteousness involves relationship. I can be good and moral by myself. I can't be righteous by myself. Righteousness involves relationship. So Jesus says, I'm coming to fulfill all righteousness. I'm going to do the things that are appropriate to the relationship that I share with the Father. So then what happens? Jesus is baptized. After being baptized, Jesus came up. So he went down into the water, and he came up out of the water. And as he comes up out of the water, immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice came out of heaven, sorry, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is baptized. He identifies with God's new covenant people. He's going to show himself to be the true Son of God by fulfilling the Old Testament. He's going to show himself to be God's new people, set a precedent for everything that's going to happen. And then when he comes up out of the water, we have like this Old Testament vision happening where the heavens open up. There's something clearly being indicated by God. The Spirit of God comes over Jesus and rests over the waters. Sounds like Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it, Terry? (laughs) See, I can go back to the garden too, all right? And God brings order and life out of this chaos with His Spirit, and then God speaks from heaven. And He says, this is my what? I heard the whispers, like, I want that confidence, all right? I know it's 9 a.m., but (laughs) this is my, nope, beloved son. Is that all he says? What does he say? In whom I am well pleased. God speaks from heaven. He speaks these lines. And this is something that was pointed out to me. Um... The lines that he speaks here are quotations or fulfillment from the Old Testament. And the reason that this is just kind of uh, new information to me is because my Bible doesn't change the font. It doesn't change the indentation. It doesn't change the text. Yet, as you read passages, and I put a couple on here, uh, like Isaiah, you see similar language used. And that would make sense because Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament. So there's a passage, for instance, like this. And this is not the only place that these verses are found. Uh, You can find these same verses or the same idea behind the language used here uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, It would make sense as the Messiah is the one coming to fulfill the Old Testament. So there's a passage like this in Isaiah 11. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And what is the Spirit going to do? The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Another similar passage Behold, my servant, whom I uphold. My chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So if passages like this are about Jesus, what is different in the Isaiah 42 passage, for instance, uh, when compared to the Matthew 3 passage or the Mark chapter 1 passage? Isaiah 42 says, Behold my... And why is that different? How is that different? What did he say in Matthew 3? Behold my servant versus behold my son. Now, one sounds better than the other, right? (laughs) Which one sounds better? Son. Uh, And I think there is a significant difference there. I think that he is trying to show Jesus is not just the servant. He is the son. And as Jesus is obeying God, as he's fulfilling these Old Testament passages, as he's coming to show his unique relationship with God, as God is announcing these things, he's revealing something to us. 
Jesus is revealing who God is. And in this passage, you have God, who Jesus calls the Father, God the Father, using the Spirit to announce or anoint His Son. And what is at the center of everything that is happening here? This is my loved. This is my loved Son. That should echo because later on in the New Testament, uh, we're going to have passages like 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, which I know you might not know 1 John 4, 7, but I know you know 1 John 4, 8. God is and love. Uh, at the center of what's going on here in this baptism account is God is showing Jesus is love. He's taking the Spirit, descending on him like a dove, to show that Jesus is love. This is God the Father saying, I love my Son. And like we read in that Isaiah passage, the Spirit resting on him is going to equip him. It's going to empower him. It's going to anoint him. But it's also communicating the love of the Father. And at the heart of, of Christianity, at the heart of what we're trying to understand about God, is this vision of love. This vision of committing myself to seeking the benefit and the well-being of other people. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you've never uh, heard this before, but the way the Bible uses the idea of love, at least in one aspect, is not the emotion of love. Uh, it's uh, a willful decision. It's a choice that I am making continually and perpetually. That's the idea behind here. It's not an emotion of love. It's a committed decision that I am making to seeking the well-being of other people, uh, of someone else. And that's what we see happening in this account. God sees his son, and he's saying, I'm going to love him because God is going to... Uh, put his son to put us in right relationship with him. Remember Jesus said, I'm coming to fulfill all righteousness. And we said righteousness is a relational word. Jesus' relationship with God is going to be our relationship as well. Jesus' relationship with God is going to be our relationship uh, with God as well. So this is how I want you guys to think about it. Did Jesus and God have a close relationship? Yeah. He says, I and the Father are one. And yet, he'll pray in places later on in Scripture, like in the book of John, to say, I want these people to be one with one another the way God and I are one. So, hermana, tú eres una con él? Are you, are you one with him? And, and if I started doing that, is, can you say that? Can you say I am one with everybody in here the same way Jesus is one with God. And if the answer is no, then maybe, maybe, maybe the implication is I might not be as one with the Father as Jesus was with God. Because if I'm struggling to be one with that guy over there or this woman over here or those people in the back because I sit in the front row because I'm a good student, then maybe I'm not as one with the Father as Jesus is. Now that's the theological side. That's the, that's the side that and I can tell like some of you are like trying to pay attention, but yeah, I know, like that's the theological side. Like it's, it's a little confusing, it's a little complex. So, so what, right? What does that got to do with me today? Jesus is 30 when he got baptized. Jesus is 30 years old when he got baptized. And I want some answers. What has Jesus done to merit God's love when he gets baptized? What do you know about Jesus prior to his baptism? And if you read Mark, you don't know a thing. <laughs> so I'll let you use the other gospel accounts. What has Jesus done before he got baptized? Anybody know? Okay. He led a sinless life. He spent time in his Father's Word. He found it important. Jesus done nothing. Jesus was born, 
And at 12 years old, he stays behind in the temple and freaks out his parents. Could you imagine losing the Son of God? Like, that's got to be stressful, right? <laughs> He's a nothing. Now, yes, some people have called him a rabbi. So there's some implication that he was teaching. And yes, for 30 years, he never checked out a girl. Guys, can you imagine, like, he was not lusting after a girl for 30 years. Like, hey, that's, it's, it's nuts, Keller, right? <laughs> for 30 years, we know he was born, he stayed behind in the temple, he was starting to teach people, but we don't have any of those teachings recorded for us. We don't know if he's done a miracle. He hasn't preached a sermon on the mount. He hasn't said any great things like love your neighbor as yourself. He hasn't taught us to pray for our enemies. He hasn't healed people. He hasn't forgiven sins. He has done nothing. And yet when he is baptized, what does his father say? Hmm? This is my son whom I love. And then he says, I am what? The guy who has done nothing, God says, I love him and I'm pleased with him. And some of you have started squirming in your seats because that's not how you understand love. You were raised in a culture, you were raised in a household, you were raised in a society where your life experiences, your upbringing, your teaching have taught you this is what love is. Love is something that I have to earn. Love is something that, that I have to grow in. But Scriptures teaches us, especially through this account, that love just is. It's a statement about our posture towards God as His child. And this is so profound, brethren. It's so counter to our experiences of love. Most of our experiences of love are set in the mind of doing things to be desirable. Think about what drives your waking hours. You work out, right? Why do you work out? I want to look good. I got to make myself more desirable. Anyone do your hair this morning? Any of the young ladies do your hair this morning? Yeah? Why would you do your hair? Because I wanted to look good. That's why. Yeah, Levi, we talked about that already, right? <laughs> like. Why do I dress the way I dress? Because I want to make myself more desirable. We go to school, we go to work, and we say, look, this is what I've accomplished in life. When I meet new people, I don't know why, I just typically ask the question, like, so where are you at in life? And people start giving me their accolades. They start saying, this is what I've done to say, look, I'm desirable, I'm admirable, love me, love me. Have a relationship with me. And yet what God teaches us is you start in a place of love. You don't need to make more money or live in such a house or drive a certain car to make yourself more valuable in the, God, in the eyes of God. Some of us are hyper aware of how we appear to others. I'm in that camp. <laughs> like body dysmorphia, that's me, brother. Like I, I have that. Like I just... I always look at myself as needing to improve because I want to be loved. I want to be desired. And I want to be pleasing towards other people. We want to be known. We want to be loved. We want to have the security that I'm making someone happy. And, and when we miss out on those things, when I don't feel loved, when I don't feel like I'm desirable, when I don't feel like I'm pleasing to someone else, I go back to that state in which I came into the world. I'm confused, and I'm fearful, and I'm anxious. I start shriveling up emotionally, and physically, and spiritually, when I don't have love, pleasure, and approval. And we strive to make ourselves lovable. We strive to make ourselves more admirable. 
Because if I do this, then my friends will like me. If I do this, then my parents will approve of me. If I do this, then my teachers will listen to me. And once I perform and once I have success, then I will be loved. But Jesus comes to us from the beginning of the Gospel accounts and says there's a love that precedes everything that your culture uh, or upbringing has taught. There's a love that is at the center of everything that before I accomplish or do something, I am loved. Not by my parents, but by God. Because guess what? Being born does not necessarily guarantee you're loved by your parents. Jesus begins his life, and he begins his walk with God, already being loved by the Father. And God saying, I am pleased with you. So everything Jesus does Is it to earn God's love? Does he start preaching and healing and teaching so that he can be more lovable? Not at all. Everything he does moving forward comes because he knows that he is the beloved son of God. He's not trying to read his Bible more, and I know he doesn't have a Bible, but he's not trying to read his Bible more to say, if I know more, God will be pleased with me. He says, I know I'm pleased. Or sorry, I know God is pleased with me. I know that I'm loved. This external love is internalized because it comes from an eternal God. So what happens next? What happens right after his baptism? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This loving presence that was there to communicate God's love to the Son now sends Jesus into the wilderness where he is tested and tempted because there's another evil presence. The presence is called the Satan, the, the tester, the adversary, the devil. And what does Satan ask Jesus three times? If you are the Son of God. Isn't it interesting? Jesus gets baptized, and God says, you're my beloved son, and I'm pleased with you. I love you, and I'm pleased with you. And then Satan comes over here, and then he's like, hey, are you really God's beloved son? Is God really happy with you? Because if God really loves you, and if God's really happy with you, why are you out in the desert by yourself? Why are you hungry? Why don't you have a kingdom? And this is what that sounds like in our heads today. If you're really loved by God, and if you're really pleasing to God, why are you single? If you're really loved by God and you're really pleasing to God, why do you feel like you have no connections at the church? If you're really loved by God and you're really pleasing to God, Why can't I please my parents? Why can't I please my Bible class teachers? Like, where are my best friends? Where are my Peter, James, and John? And so that evil presence that in the wilderness is trying to get Jesus to doubt his status as the beloved Son of God. And he's still at work today. Trying to get us to doubt ourselves in the beloved status of God. If you were really loved by God and you were really pleasing to God, you wouldn't have this temptation in your life. Is that true? Not at all. Because we know that God was pleased and loved Jesus, and that didn't exclude him from temptation at all. He was led by the what? The Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. In every case, Jesus humbles himself. He quotes Scripture. And in the power of the Spirit, Jesus fights against the one who is trying to get him to doubt his identity. The Spirit led Jesus. is so vital to us understanding our identity as a child of God. What does this have to do with you? There's another passage in the Bible that that uses this same language, and it's found in Romans chapter 8. So if you're using the Black Pew Bible, it's on page 1003. And I want you guys to open there. I want you, uh, so in the Red Pew Bible, I don't know where it is. I didn't look it up. 
Uh, maybe you could help him find Romans. Because um, this is a really important passage. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It's so cool when people are turning their Bibles and you can hear it. Like, oh, man, that sound just gives me goosebumps. Like, I love it. Um, if you're using a tablet, I can't hear your finger touching the screen. So, But that's good, too. Um, Romans chapter 8. So we've established so far, Jesus does nothing necessarily to merit God's love and pleasure. We've established that Jesus has the Spirit to show that he is loved and that that spirit continues on with him, even in the face of temptation. And all that leads us to Romans 8, because Romans 8 speaks very similarly to the things that we just read. Uh, I had no idea that the word spirit was found so often in uh, Romans chapter 8. It's found 18 times uh, in this section. It's a, it's, a crazy, it's a crazy time in Scripture where spirit is just found all over the place. And I'm going to say that so you don't get distracted. Uh, we're going to start in Romans 14, uh, 8, 14, but uh, just know that this whole section is about the Spirit. Uh, I encourage you to go read it later. But this is what the text says. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness uh, to face temptation, to face the adversary. He says, if you're led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you, and this is where you can make it personal, for you, for I, have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but I have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which I cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit doesn't make us slaves because slaves live in fear and under obligation. The Spirit and adoption that we have as sons lets us know that we are loved and pleasing to God. God has bound Himself to us in the person of Jesus to restore us and to redeem us. God Himself comes and He fulfills all righteousness and says, look, the right relationship that I share with Jesus, that's your right relationship with me now, Bree. Like, we can share in this right relationship because of what Jesus has done. And that is just so profound and Paul talks like that in Romans 8. So the Spirit comes and, and it comes upon us. It takes residence in our lives. And if you're led by the Spirit, then what do you cry out? Abba, Father. Now, it's interesting. Most of you know that that is not a Greek word. And the reason that you know that is because you also know the New Testament is written in Greek. And you know that uh, even... Predominantly, there was another language called Latin uh, that was around at that time. And the Greek and the Latin share the word for father that is pater. That's not what he says. He doesn't say by which we can cry out pater. He says we can cry out Abba. Not the 70s or 60s rock band, okay? Uh, we cry out Abba, which is this ancient Aramaic word. Now, this is this is what comes to mind. Um, I was in San Francisco one time. I was at the airport, um, and I was just kind of waiting for my flight. And then I hear in the background this little boy going, Abba, 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 Abba. And it stood out to me because I knew the text, like, oh, man, this little kid is, like, trying to find his dad. And so, like, I, I turn around, I go to the little boy, and, you know, like, he's like, Abba, and I'm like, Abba, dad, right? <laughs> he's like, Abba, Abba. Um, and so then I just proceed to find the most Middle Eastern guy at the airport. Uh, and he was right around the corner. He was like, it, was, it was great. Uh, he had just you know, uh, walked off to, to drop off his luggage with his family. And he comes back, and you know, then he starts like, you know, I don't know, maybe yelling at his kid. I don't know what he did. <laughs> you know, but the kid, in desperation, was crying out for his father. And that has always stuck with me because Jesus did not speak Greek or Latin, to my knowledge. He doesn't call his father pater, but he calls him Abba, like my father. What do you call your dad? Dad. Like, 
That's significant. Jesus says, you get to call my father what I call him. Abba. Dad. And that's not to be irreverent. That's not to be flippant. That's not to be uh, disrespectful. But it's to say that Jesus uses his language and that exact same language is what we get to use because the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Matthew is trying to get us to see that what is true of Jesus is true of anyone that is going to reach out to Him in faith. This Spirit comes to us and it testifies You are the beloved Son of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This Spirit anoints us. This Spirit shows us God's love for us. This Spirit shows us that God is attentive to our needs and that He's always been attentive. That He's eternally loved us. That from before the foundation of the world, God knew that He would send Jesus to die for you and me. And make it personal, because sometimes we say you and me, are like, yeah, I know. No, He knew that you were going to be born. And he knew, like, man, I'm going to one day have to send my son to die for you. I remember your name, I forgot it. Evan. Okay, I was going to say Ethan. Ethan, are you worth Jesus Christ dying? Hmm? You don't know. Thank you for being honest. God says, look, before you were thought in your parents' mind, before, and it's kind of awkward, before, before you ever like, were thought in your parents' mind, God, before he speaks the universe into existence, he says, you know what, one day Ethan's going to be born. I know that. So I'm going to send my son to die for that too. You got to know that you're worth it. Because you are. Like, you are. And God says, just like He did with Jesus, before you do anything, I need you to know that I love you and that I am pleased with you. And you have a spirit inside of you that is testifying with the other spirit that's trying to say, no, 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 like, I'm not worth it. That's not it. That's not true. You know what God wants from me? He wants me to read my Bible. You know what God wants for me? He wants me to go to the right church. You know what God wants for me is to, to go and convert people. You know what God wants for me? He wants me to have the righteous family. You know what God wants for me is he needs me to earn his love. And God says, look, before you ever got an A in math or a D like I did, uh, you were loved and you were pleasing to God. He loves you. He thinks of your needs, and He serves you. And you need to know that that is true. So I'm going to send my Spirit to remind you of your identity, who you are and whose you are. The Spirit reminds us that we are loved by God, but one of the greatest challenges that you and I have in Christianity is to discipline our minds to listen to the voice of the Spirit. Because we listen to every other voice. We listen to Satan. We listen to our own voice that says, no, God doesn't love me. God is not pleased with me. And we start doubting our state as the beloved Son of God. But the Spirit comes and reminds us. And He says, look, I need you to learn to live and claim your status and your identity as this child of God. You are loved by God. Even when the world doesn't love you. And brethren, as long as we allow our parents and our teachers and our siblings and our friends and our church to determine whether or not we are beloved, we are caught in this deception of a dying world. And that world is either going to accept us or reject us according to its own agenda and according to its own trends. And the great spiritual battle begins when we start reclaiming our status as God's beloved children. Long before our parents saw us, God used his loving eyes to see us. Long before others heard our voices, we were heard by God. Long before others spoke to us, God 
was speaking to us. That eternal love was speaking to us. The longing voice of God is trying to get our attention every single day above all other voices, including our own, saying, you are loved. And I'm going to give you my spirit so that you can constantly cry out, Abba, Father. And this is not necessary to say because I think we all know this. But you do not merit God's love. And even in that example of parent to child, it's not a perfect example. Because yes, you love your children. And I hope that your children came into a loving home. And I hope that they came into a place where one or two parents wanted to love them. But you come with imperfections. And with unintentionally, and I do this too, unintentionally we start doing things that cause our children to doubt their love. I love running. Like I love running. My oldest daughter, she runs. She loves to run with me, and we go for miles. My middle child said to me a few months ago, when we were out on a walk, she started crying. She goes, Dad, I know you wish that I was never born. And I was like, oh. I was like, where's that coming from? She goes, because I know you love to run. And I know that Bria likes to run. I hate running. And you would love me if I ran. And that's kind of what happens in our heads, right? I've never communicated that to her. I've never once said anything about running towards her. But she was like, look, I know you love this person, and I know you love this, so therefore, if I don't do that, you don't love me. The same voice is in our heads, <laughs> saying, well, God only loves me if I know the scriptures the way brother or sister so-and-so do. God only loves me if I can lead singing the way that brother so-and-so does. God only loves me if I can be the kind of mom that this person is. God only loves me. And God, like me, is like, where in the world did you get that from? I never once said that. And I looked at her with tears in her eyes and tears in my eyes, saying, like, I love you because you're a lot like me in your personality. And I was like, I don't need you to run at all. You are loved. And she struggles with this. And I know my other children do. Because we get our concept of love from being desirable and being admirable. And God says, you got to stop that. You are loved. Learn to live and learn to claim your identity as a truly loved one of God. In God's eyes, you cannot make yourself more lovable. You can't make yourself more desirable. But you know what you can do is you can make yourself a child of God. So this morning, several of us are going to partake of unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. And we're going to partake of it as a memorial to our brother, Jesus Christ, the one who is loved and pleasing to God. And if you don't know why that's happening, or you're not going to partake this morning because you have not been baptized, then God is making an appeal today through his word. Listen to his word. Listen to his word. Listen to people that love you. And think about what Jesus is and what he means and the relationship that I share with him that can be our relationship too. I praise you with all of my love.